Uh, yeah, I hope my talk can give you guys a taste of Web3 security. So my name is Pei Yu Wang. I'm a security engineer. Uh, so what I do is uh, application penetration testing, uh, mostly Web3 applications, like apps and wallet. And I also do uh, smart contract audits and security research. Uh, my past talk at DEF CON are in the uh, blockchain village, which I talk about uh, exploiting crypto wallets and uh, DeFi scam and rob pools. So outside of like words, I'm like a DeFi apes, I'm like a mean coin uh, traders. So blockchain and the apps. So since the first uh, DeFi summer in 2020, uh, the, uh, the blockchain ecosystem has exceptional growth. There's a lot of things being built. And one way to catalyze them is like applications, develop tools, uh, infrastructure, and the protocols, which is the blockchain itself. So we apps average, and let's talk about applications. Uh, so the most common apps that have web free products are the following. The first one is centralized exchanges, such as like Coinbase, uh, Binance, which you guys are probably familiar with, uh, and then data platform. So the raw data for uh, blockchain transactions are extremely hard for people to read. So uh, there's like application like EtherScan that help uh, people to like read data, read transaction data. And there's a wallet. Uh, so wallet is a type of applications that holds the private key and perform the signing request uh, when requested. The most popular wallet probably is the uh, wallet MetaMask. And then there's uh, the apps. So I def uh, the definition I give the app is a wide range of applications that include the functionality that implements through the uh, on-chain smart contract. So all four type of application plays a very important role in the uh, application space in blockchain, and they all have their own uh, unique type of services. And today, I will talk about the one before the yeah. app. So throughout this presentation, I will be talking about a lot of web three technologies. So I want to start by explaining them in web two terms. So first, smart contract. Smart contract, you can think of it's a backend API server that uh, privilege functions. So inside smart contracts, there's a lot of functions, and some functions can only be called by, say, admin or owner address. Those functions typically are uh, actions, operations, contract. Um, and then there are transactions. Transaction, you can think of it's like a, a bundle of post requests that's sent to the smart contract. Transaction hash is a unique identifier for each transaction where you can uh, uh, pull, the info, pull the transaction information out by using the transaction hash. Uh, so gas, so imagine uh, a web server that charge a certain amount of fee for each post request. That's like the, uh, so each, each blockchain transaction will charge uh, some sort of like a, a crypto assets. And when there's a lot of people sending this like post request to a smart contract, the more you pay, the faster your transaction uh, will get executed. Uh, so blockchain is formed by like a block by block, and each block you can think of it contains uh, multiple like post requests, uh, and then each block has like set amount of time in between. You can think of the batch of post requests get it, get executed like block by block, and there's some time in between. So blockchain RPC is the communication channel that exposed by like blockchain nodes, so the outside can that entity can talk to the uh, blockchain. And NFT is type of like uh, uh, digital assets that inform of an image with ownership information stored on blockchain and the image data and metadata stored So this is like a general workflow for uh, the app. The, the app you see there is Uniswap, probably most popular and most well, well uh, most used. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you go to the website, there's like a connect button and you click that. That will triggers a connection request uh, pop up from the wallet. And if you trust the application, you can click next so that your wallet is going to connect with the dApp. And after connection is established, you can start using the dApp. In this example, I exchanged 0.01 Ether to 24 USDT, and I can, I can click the swap. And that transaction gets sent to the extension wallet. And once you click the confirm, which means you sign the transaction, and that transaction will be sent to the blockchain and that execute. And then that transaction will get as ex executed, and the token will be small. Uh, next, I'll talk about the architecture. So this is a uh, standard web, web 2 applications where you, ha you have like client-side uh, app, and then you have like server-side components, like web server API database. I'm sure everyone familiar with that. And then the apps I put into three categories. 
The first one is uh, API less. Yeah. Uh, what it means is the app uh, on the server side, there's no API. They just set the HTML just file, file. And the main logic is inside the uh, smart contract. So, uh, for example, the uh, example I give uh, Uniswap, the early day version of Uniswap is uh, like API less the app. Uh, where the like token exchange rate information is calculated inside a small contract and the front end just uh, help with like user, user interactions. So in this type of the app, the attack surface or the application side is quite limited. Uh, so, and this type of the app typically build with the React framework and React has sort of like SSS building protection there. So it's hard to find success there. And then unless you have like, you can completely take over the site by say using like DNS hijacking, the application side, uh, the attack surface is very limited. And typically, when this kind of application get exported, it's often the vulnerability from the smart contract. Uh, now, the second one is API enabled the app. Uh, so compared to the last one, this one ha on the server side has a service APIs. And one example is say, uh, NFT creation the app. So it, 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 the server has API allow users to upload images or like NFT metadata JSON to the backend, uh, and then the backend gonna return like a URL. Route to talk to the small contract. Uh, the attack surface for this type of app uh, increased, but the vulnerability on the application side is mostly like Web2 related. And now move to the full scale D apps. So, full scale D apps, uh, the backend is going to talk to the small like read data or send transactions. Um, so, oftentimes in the full scale D app, the small, the, uh, small contract will have privileged functions and the account. That can call those private functions, those private key are stored in the backend server. So you have a way to say, for example, compromise the server or, or have trigger some like an arrow. You're likely you're likely able to say uh, obtain that key from the server and completely transfer out all the money from the smart contract or about uh, like really damages. So the majority of the app in 2024 are like a full scale D app uh, compared to like 2020. The by summer, there's a lot of like APS, API less the app. So one example of like a full scale D app is cross chain bridge. So cross chain bridge, cross chain bridge allows a uh, user to transfer to, to the bridge token okay, from one blockchain to another. For example, to uh, which token from like uh, Because blockchain, the small contract of blockchain cannot talk to uh, each other with uh, cross blockchain. So, this type of application must require a uh, blockchain component. So how bridge it work is uh, on a source chain, user deposit token into the source chain smart contract, and the backend monitor that deposit event and process it. And if everything looks good, it will call the privilege functions in the destination chain smart contract and release the data to the user. Uh, so let's talk about the SRAM modeling. So from a SRAM modeling perspective, that's in Web3 are the, uh, the three models. First one is uh, for the secrets, the private key. If you can get those, it will, you can have full control over the uh, assets in the address, or you can uh, uh, invoke like privileged functions in the smart contract. The second one is uh, signatures. So for certain type of tokens, if you can, uh, certain type of tokens, it allows to other address to use the object. If you can have the uh, special message signed by the uh, and there's, there's a lot of like that like you could sign in those type of message and then bring your users wallet. The last one is API keys. So if API keys is for those like crypto uh, such as like centralized exchanges or certain like those API keys, you can take. I talk about like I, uh, I will start to talk about block uh, client side attack by mentioning a term called already uh, connected wallet. So in the uh, DF workflow session, I talk about that uh, if a user wants to use the DF, the DF must connect to their wallet. And in, there's a best practice in Web3 that users should only connect their wallet to the DF they trust. And then once and when user trusts the DF, they will, they will just sign, and they just sign whatever like things that you yeah, want the user to sign. So if any vulnerability that exists in like, client side vulnerability inside the, the app that has a lot of user connect wallet and it's very popular, 
the severity is going to increase like, dramatically. So from a client-side attack perspective, there are like a three things attackers most likely would want to do. The first one is initial malicious transactions. How that can happen is when the attacker can um, basically modify the JavaScript code of the uh, website. For example, through like cross-site scripting, some hijacking. Uh, it's possible to have those malicious jobs to initialize uh, the malicious transaction to take out all the security. And if in general, JavaScript is not possible, and if it, like hacking is possible, then it's, it's, uh, another option is to deceive the user. The last one is uh, by users to a fishing site. And for uh, already connected website, um, everything that can initial uh, will have critical vulnerability. So as it says, right, in Web2, even you have like a count takeover, it's like high, uh, it's uh, maybe like a low critical, but in Web3, it's definitely going to be critical. So let's talk about service side. Um, there's like sort of like four things the attacker will want to do. The first one is stealing the keys from the server. Um, right, so if you're stealing the key, you probably can figure out the password as one project. And this is sort of a lot of way can protect you. And the second one is stealing crypto assets from other users' account or admin's account. That will probably buy like a uh, broken access control or maybe um, or, or you can spend or, or, um, assets more than your actual balance. That can probably happen like business logic error or risk condition. And for NFTs, as I mentioned, those like images are supported like blockchain. And if those images go down, this NFT value is going to drop like dramatically. And that's what can happen when like uh, the NFT goes So in Web3, anything that can touch is money has a critical severity. Because I think the most important thing that can happen is you know, removing uh, um, so in the last session, I talk about how Web2 attack vector have higher severity in Web3. In the next sessions, I will talk about uh, kind of like unique better attack service that can be enabled in Web3. Uh, so I think due to Kong Kong's screen, I cannot go over like each sub item one by one. But in short, these applications that Incorrectly process transactions, it can And it's possible to initiate attack against backend components through smart contract. And if the application handles uh, uh, larger to handle different SS class is incorrect, uh, it can also uh, yeah. So the first case I want to talk about is uh, basically crypto in gas via unrestricted APIs. So this application is a yeah. That require user to register wallet for participation. So how the registr registration workflow is this uh standard API, um, which user can provide their own chain address. Uh, and then uh, the back end is called a top the register function, the smart contract. the function can only be called like a smart device or something like that. So what's the issue? I give you a different mic. Hello. Wow. <laughs> Great. So, well, the case study just started, so you didn't miss anything. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the finding here is that, well, that's amazing. Uh, is so the APIs accept any Ethereum uh, address as long as the address data is in the correct format. So each time the API is called, the backend gonna send a transaction to the smart contract. And as we, I talk about, each transaction can cause gas. Gas is like, a, you can think of as money. So the way to export this is like, you, I can generate a bunch of like a random Ethereum address and keep calling that API to to let the admin wallet keep sending transactions to smart contract and eventually consume all the ethers in the admin's wallet. So this not only consume all the ether, but allow like, and prevent like other user to, re to register. 
so this is like the uh, transaction log when I do the testing. So this is in the test net. So there's no actual like uh, SS lost. Um, so I write a script to generate a bunch of address and, and put the request into like Burp re repeater and I just send it. And then when I uh, go to user scan and I see the, those like records. Uh, the second one is poor transaction time handling lead to DNF service attack. So this can actually happen in any D app that have API to trigger the backend to send a transaction and keep the connection open while waiting for the on-chain transaction uh, execution results. So the, uh, the example code snippet is I generate using like ChatGPTs. So it's basically a, a API called deposit. Uh, and when user call this API, it's gonna trigger the uh, backend to send a deposit transaction to the smart contract. And the code will wait for the transaction executed and then send HTTP response to the users. So what's the problem here is that, for example, on Ethereum mainnet, the block time is 12 seconds, which means the HTTP connection will be remain open for at least 12 seconds. If the chain is congested, it can, uh, the, the time can be much longer. So uh, to exploit these uh, APIs, uh, only, like only one single machine is required to send out a bunch of like API requests and to uh, occupy all the connection slot and the and server is not going to handle any like more requests. Um, the next one is poor transaction time handling lead to risk conditions. So this is a uh, gaming, like a game fight D app that allow users to purchase like in-game items using crypto assets. Um, so deposit workflow by uh, user deposit crypto assets into the game smart contract and then back and uh, retrieve those deposit informations from the smart contract to increase the user's uh, in-game balance. And what's the interesting part is the withdraw crypto workflow is uh, the withdraw workflow work by users submit a withdraw API request to the backend and the backend verify the user's balance and call the uh, privilege function withdraw in a smart contract. And after the transaction finished, uh, the token will arrive in users on chain wallet and the backend is going to update the user balance to zero. So what's the problem here is that um, the backend uh, update the user balance only after the, after the transaction uh, successfully executed and it didn't lock the transaction balance uh, when it sends the on-chain transactions. So in the so for, for example, in Ethereum, like 12 second block time, user have 12 second window to spend their like uh, in-game like currencies. Uh, so they can basically in those uh, time period, they can buy a hundred worth of like uh, uh, in-game items and then wait for the transaction to finish and those tokens will be arrived in their wallet. Uh, this way, the user can basically purchase all the in-game items for free. Um, and the race condition can also happen in like Web2, but uh, the, uh, the time window for that in Web2 is much smaller. But in Web3, the time window in this case is at least 12 seconds. So it's uh, much easier to pull off. Um, the next one is a uh, bridge contract, bridge backend, lack of small contract address validations. So uh, I, I talk about like, how bridge work briefly, uh, previous slide. So for this particular bridge, the workflow is like user deposit token into smart contract on the source chain and obtain the transaction hash. And then the user submit the transaction hash to the backend through APIs and the backend fetch the uh, information with the transaction hash uh, info to validate the deposit. And if anything goes correctly, the bridge backend really is gonna call the privilege function in the smart contract on the destination chain and release the fund to the user. Um, so for this kind of bridge, the backend actually need to validate a tons of stuff. And in that particular application, it need to validate, for example, the transaction status is successful and uh, they need to take, uh, uh, get the information of the deposit amount, the sender receiver address. And if anything is not validated correctly, it can cause the bridge to become vulnerable. And in this case, the, the backend does not verify the smart contract that received the token is the one operated by the uh, by the project. Um, so to exploit this vulnerability, the attack flow will be, uh, I am going to deploy a malicious uh, smart contract on the blockchain that basically share the same functionality as the legitimate smart contract. And then make a token deposit into that fake bridge contract and obtain the transaction hash. And then submit a transaction hash to the bridge backend through APIs and, uh, and wait for the bridge backend to process the hash and because I'm missing the address validations, so he thinks the address is correct. 
and then it's gonna release the tokens uh, to the to the uh, uh, users on destination chain. And when that happens, um, and and after that, the user can withdraw his uh, like token sent to the fake contract because that's he had full control of that. And if this vulnerability get exploited, like all the tokens in the destination chain smart contract can be stolen. Right, so the last case. So this is like a lightweight crypto trading applications where user can deposit assets and perform like token swap. Uh, the backend use like Fireblock as custodian services. Uh, how the deposit work is user requests a, 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 like a deposit address through APIs and then the backend gonna get one from Fireblock and then the user gonna deposit crypto asset to the address. And then the backend periodic, periodically curate the fileblock.get transaction API. And if it sees the deposit transactions, it's gonna uh, give the user the in-app balance. So when, are, when we are doing the testing, so we deposit like 0.1 meta token to the deposit address and the, in, and the balance increased by 1.1. Now we were so confused because this is not like double or 10 times, it just, it's like increased by one. So we go to the on-chain, the uh, Polygon scam and see there's only like 0.1 Matic arrive in the address. Um, however, we found a record of like a scam NFT airdropped into that address. So it's quite common for scammers to airdrop like NFTs uh, with like fish inside link in the token information to a newly active address within the blockchain. Newly active address is, is means the address like received the, like, a, uh, like a, crypt, a crypto with value for the first time. So the backend treat that value list NFT as a valid like a, a MATIC deposit. Uh, so this is a white box testing and we found out the root cause is that the backend just uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, when, when it parses the information returned by Fireblock, it failed to check the token type. So to exploit these issues, we, we, we deploy a ERC-1155 NFT and main 99 NFT with no value to the address and which caused our uh, account to increase like 99 MATIC. Uh, so to summarize the state of like DApp security, so right now with the advance of like blockchain ecosystem, DApp becomes like more and more complex and some of them start integrating heavy Web2 components. And often vulnerability are introduced in DApp because a lot of developers either lack of Web3 security knowledge or Web2 security knowledge. And uh, Web2 uh, Web vulnerability in Web3 application often has like increased severity because uh, it can touch monies. Um, and unlike smart contract export, where, where it's like public viewable, the exploitation of the backend might have less exposure because no one can see it, uh, but it can still happen. So to secure the app, especially a DApp with like heavy backend components, it is like as important to get uh, penetration testing compared uh, as like getting a, like audits for your smart contract. Um, or is, is this is the last slide. So if you want to get into a DApp hacking, uh, I would suggest like you, you be this first be decent at Web2 application hacking because at the end of the day, there's tons of Web2 components and you need to be familiar with different type, the architecture of different type of dApps. That way you will know what the attack services are for this app. And the best way to do it is play around with the app to experiment then. An investment of like $100 of crypto, uh, probably gonna waste in gas is gonna be enough. And to understand like basic uh, concept of blockchain, including those like Web3 terminology, you don't really need to understand how blockchain work. And then you learn the smart contract, Solidity smart contract language so you can understand smart contract. And sometimes you can find some like hidden attack services. And it's not necessarily require you to know like how to do a secure audit of smart contract. That's a completely different topic. Uh, and go find a DApp and hack it of way legally. And start like and so I believe like starting hacking the app is probably one of the best way to like, for like web two website hackers that pivot into web three security. And uh, well, if you want to ask me like why like web three security, I mean like uh, look at this bounty like ten million. Uh, well, I I don't think this can ever happen in web two. So uh, so yeah, uh, I guess people love money. Uh, all right, so that's my talk. I hope you guys enjoy and learn something about web three security. Thank you.